Okay, so we are on the topic of optimization for training uh, deep models. Uh, and we have a number of topics to cover and we'll cover algorithms like AdaGrad, RMS Prop, Adam Optimizer and so on. So optimization uh, is uh, complex for neural networks, more difficult than uh, in, in other areas of machine learning where we encounter optimization. Um, so the, our focus in the case of optimization is to find parameters of a neural network that re reduces a cost function J of W, right? So that is the uh, standard goal is uh, what values of W are gonna minimize a cost function. And uh, it typically includes uh, a performance measure evaluated on an entire training set, as well as an additional regularization term. So the cost function involves a performance measure on the, on the training set, uh, as well as uh, an additional regularization term. So uh, we can say all deep learning is an instance of a recipe specification of a data set, a cost function, a model, an optimization procedure. So, you know, in that sense, studying an optimization procedure is as essential as uh, studying uh, what, what is a cost function and uh, what is a model. And uh, in the example uh, below here, uh, what do we mean by these things? Uh, the recipe for linear regression. In linear regression, the data set consists of a uh, a matrix X, matrix in the sense uh, the uh, rows correspond to samples and the columns correspond to features. And uh, we have uh, uh, a vector Y corresponding to each of the samples. So it would be all the values, or we can look at it as input is, a, uh, is X is a vector, output is uh, a scalar Y, that's a regression problem. So that's the nature of the data set. And the cost function we would specify would be something like J of W is equal to minimize uh, the uh, expectation, which is, uh, which is the sum over all the samples on the data of uh, some loss function. In this case, log P model of Y given X uh, plus the uh, lambda times W squared. And uh, where did we get that log Y given X? Uh, it is actually, we're specifying the model here in regression as the P model of Y given X is nothing but the normal distribution of Y given X transpose W plus B, it's variance of one. So that's a normal distribution whose mean is X transpose W plus B, and that is corrupted by the noise Y. And uh, that model uh, leads to uh, a maximum likelihood formulation. If that is the probability, then um, what is the probability of, uh, for the entire data set? and uh, which ends up giving us this log, and then we take the logarithm of it. So that's why we get the log of this quantity. And then we make it in expectation is over all the samples from the likelihood, the, the, pro the product of the uh, normal probabilities become the summation, that summation is nothing but uh, the expectation. And we use the negative version saying rather than maximize it, let's minimize it. So anyway, the model specification cost function are closely related to each other. Optimization algorithm is solving for when the cost is minimal. When is this J of W as small as possible is the optimization problem. Importance of neural network optimization. This is saying, hey, look, don't ignore it. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is an important topic. Uh, it, this says uh, in practice, it's common to invest days to months of time on hundreds of machines to solve a single instance of a neural network training problem. Um, I suppose uh, when they came up with uh, with uh, things like BERT or GPT-3 or whatever, right? They probably had to do that. And we all take advantage of it by saying all their uh, embedded uh, uh, values or, or the weights and so on. We can just take it from them. But anyway, that's what they had to do it. They had to do. Because the problem is so important, so expensive, people have spent a lot of Time, uh, specialized optimization techniques have been developed for solving it. And uh, so a plan of discussion is uh, how does, uh, uh, how does uh, training optimization differ from pure optimization? Okay, we've already talked about that a bit. Uh, challenges that make optimization of a neural network difficult. And several practical algorithms, including optimization algorithms, strategies for in initializing parameters, 
and uh, and uh, most advanced algorithms uh, adapt learning rates or, le or leverage second derivatives the cost function and uh, or combine simple optimization algorithms into higher level procedures that's the meta algorithms so uh, deep learning frameworks such as uh, keras or tensorflow or pytorch uh, they 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 offer for example keras offers uh, contains implementation of building blocks such as layers objectives activation functions like objectives is the loss function activation functions optimizers and tools to make working with image and text data easier so these are what are, what are offered in python and tensorflow and so optimizers are one essential part of any machine learning or deep learning uh, algorithm you're going to implement. Well, this is some Keras code uh, for MNIST uh, neural network. And uh, you know, you, you're all familiar with it. You implemented a project and so on. I was just highlighting one line here saying model.compile optimizer equal to SGD. So it is saying uh, we are going to use the stochastic gradient descent as the optimizer and the loss is categorical cross entropy and the metric is accuracy, right? So this says it's as simple as simply saying what are you gonna use SGD or is it Adam? I understand from um, Mohammed, your project number one, which you handed in last week uh, was to compare two different uh, optimizers. So you're already familiar with SGD and maybe Adam optimizer, something like that. So you've done this a bit before, but anyway, right now we are looking at uh, you know, how are those things implemented? And popular optimization methods uh, are a gradient descent uh, where we are heading towards the minimum. This is the contours of uh, constant density. And uh, so in gradient descent, uh, we use theta gets theta minus epsilon G. The G stands for the derivative. And the derivative is one over M is the batch size derivative over the batch of the loss function, right? In, in, uh, in regression problem, let's say. And uh, here is uh, another uh, variant, a great descent, it's called coordinate descent. Minimize f of x with respect to a single variable x, xi, then with respect to xj, et cetera. We're kind of going like that, like this, like this, like this, like this. So it's coordinate. You're kind of treating all the coordinates one at a time to head towards the minimum. And uh, this shows uh, what stochastic gradient descent does. Uh, where uh, it is not directly heading, you know, like a gradient descent, it's kind of zigzagging and uh, ends up uh, where you want to be. It is a kind of regularization we have seen by adding uh, noise uh, and uh, stochastic gradient descent is, uh, is the method that is uh, the go-to method largely. All right, so that is uh, this opening uh, set of slides. Okay, let me go on to, uh, hmm. oh, I need to reopen the next one. Okay, this uh, next set of slides is an easy topic. How does uh, learning differs from optimization? Okay, this is 8.1. How learning differs from optimization, all right? 
So learning versus pure optimization, empirical risk minimization, surrogate loss functions and early stopping, batch and mini batch. Okay, those are the topics here. All right. So um, uh, how does uh, optimization for deep learning differ from traditional optimization? There are several ways. Uh, machine learning acts indirectly. We care about some performance measure P defined in the training set, which may be intractable. We reduce a different cost function J theta in the hope that doing so will reduce P. Okay, this is a essential contradiction for you to be aware of that uh, how are you gonna measure the performance of your algorithm? You say, I'm gonna use accuracy measure. Then uh, what is it your algorithm is trying to do? It is trying to minimize cross entropy. I said, what? Why are you trying to uh, optimize something called cross entropy? Well, uh, I'm going to be measuring the performance on accuracy. Why don't you go and minimize, uh, minimize the error rate, right? So it says uh, directly minimizing the error, error rate may be intractable, all right? So Perceptron uh, did that kind of a thing, trying to minimize the uh, error rate. It did not use the, uh, use the uh, differentiable uh, uh, activation function and it's not uh, differentiable and so on. And so it cannot, uh, the problem cannot be solved in some kind of an iterative manner. So, uh, so we say, let us uh, use uh, another function, which is uh, we defined in terms of probability and so on. The output is not one or zero. The output is a value between zero and one gives a probability as output. And so we end up saying, uh, let us uh, maximize the uh, likelihood or minimize the uh, negative log likelihood, that kind of thing. So we use that rather than the, the, uh, the actual performance measure. So that's, that's an interesting point to keep in mind. We reduce a different cost function J theta in the hope that doing so will reduce P. So you're gonna use accuracy as the measure, but you, your algorithm was trying to minimize the cost function. So there is, a, there is a, uh, an issue to be aware of. Pure optimization, minimizing J is a goal in itself. So it, it is differing in two ways. One is we are not even defining uh, the, uh, the quantity we are trying to minimize though that we're gonna measure the performance on, we use something else. Not only that, we don't even try and uh, minimize that quantity. Uh, we use uh, some measures like regularization is put into it saying, uh, let us uh, not just worry about the criterion to be minimized, but also bring in regularization, which is the idea of generalization. So um, uh, this shows the typical cost function uh, without regularization. It says expect, we just saw this uh, formula earlier on. And uh, we con this is unregularized. We consider the unregularized supervised uh, learning case and um, so on, which is uh, where the arguments of the loss function are of f x theta and y, right? F, f, the, f is the model and uh, y is the output. So the objective function with respect to uh, the uh, uh, training set uh, is, is given by this with respect to the data, all right? And uh, uh, we'd prefer to minimize the corresponding ob objective function where the expectation is across the data generating distribution rather than over the finite training set. Well, this is, this is saying this expression at the bottom box is different from the expression at the top. What's so different? Uh, the only thing is this says P hat are data, this is P data. So this is saying we are doing it with respect to the data set that has been given to us. This one is saying is uh, all of the data that is that would have been possible, right? Data generating distribution from what data it came from, okay, which we don't know. We only have samples available. So J, J star of theta is uh, to do this rather than this. The goal of a machine learning as algorithm is to reduce this expected generalization error. We say that it's the generalization error which we should minimize rather than the uh, training set error that we should minimize, right? And um, so this second quantity here is uh, known as the risk. So that's a specialized terminology. 
So the true risk is this quantity. Empirical risk with the M training samples is shown over here is one over M. This is the expectation is being replaced by summation I equal to one through M with M training samples taken from that distribution is one over M of that. And uh, uh, empirical risk minimization with the M training examples is uh, this quantity. Okay. Um, empirical risk minimization is not very useful, prone to overfitting, can uh, simply memorize the training data, right? So empirical minimization is prone to over, overfitting. That's why we use SGD, stochastic gradient descent is commonly used, but uh, many useful loss functions have zero one loss. That is, uh, it is either correct or wrong. No useful derivatives. We must use a slightly different approach. So a quantity we must optimize is even more different from what we truly want to optimize. So these are the uh, little caveats, contradictions that arise. So we use a surrogate loss function, which is what I've been talking about. Exactly minimizing zero one loss is typically intractable, exponential in the input di dimension, even for a linear classifier. So in, in such situations, we use a surrogate loss function, acts as a proxy, but has advantages. Negative log likelihood is, uh, of the correct class is surrogate for zero one loss. So instead of using zero one loss, zero one loss would simply say, if you have classified it correctly, it's a zero loss. If you classified it uh, uh, wrongly, it is a loss of one, you made a mistake. So you would simply count it up. So that is how we're measuring the performance. So that is one type of loss function, which is intractable uh, because there is no way of uh, approaching the parameters that is gonna minimize that. And instead of that, we state it probabilistically and, uh, and it allows the model to estimate conditional probabilities of classes given the input. So that's a surrogate loss function. Surrogate may even learn more. Oh, wow. This says using log likelihood surrogate, uh, test set zero one loss continues, continues to decrease for a long time after the training set zero one loss has reached zero in training. So this says it is possible to get a better setting for the weights than if you had somehow used the exact loss function because one can improve classifier robustness by further pushing the classes apart. It says if you exactly use the zero one loss, as soon as you got everything right and then you would stop. This is saying it might go further by actually pushing the boundaries apart and uh, allows you to deal with samples that are going to be very close to the boundary, right? There's extracting more information from the training data than with minimizing zero one loss. So this is another important concept to keep in mind in machine learning that uh, we use a surrogate means something in place of, right? Instead of what we're trying to minimize, we use minimize something else in place of it. Uh, learning does not stop at minimum. We just talked about that. Um, often stops when derivatives are still large. Okay, so these are all these fine variations it's talking about. And then the idea of batch algorithms. And uh, there is all kinds of justification for that decomposition into a sum. Uh, this is, uh, you know, the maximum likelihood parameters are arg max of theta, right? What is the value of theta that's going to maximize this uh, likelihood over here, log likelihood over here, maximizing this, you know, the same kind of arguments here and commonly used property of GT uh, is it's- uh, uh, Professor, gradient. there is a question. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I'm glad to entertain questions. Go ahead, ask me the question. So the question is, if log likelihood can push classes apart, mm. isn't it performing regularization? Mm. <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, yeah, one could argue at that level that, uh, uh, see, see, we talk of regularization after we've decided what is the loss function we are going to work with, right? Uh, then we talk about, um, you know, instead of just minimizing that, now you bring in regularization. We are talking about a regularization here 
which is even before setting up the loss function. The loss function itself is based on the surrogate loss function rather than the original loss function. So uh, in that process of choosing it, there is some type of regularization that is going on. Yes, we can argue like that, but uh, normally we don't uh, think of uh, regularization as one uh, in the choice of the surrogate function. Actually, for all practical purposes, we can take it that uh, the surrogate loss function comes from uh, a probabilistic formulation. That's all it is. So that is the loss function because we use uh, either uh, either the maximum likelihood, uh, sum of squared errors as a criterion, which comes from maximum likelihood in regression, or we use cross entropy, which is used in classification and some variants of that. So, so we said that is it. Regularization comes on top of it. You're saying, well, by choosing that itself, aren't you regularizing something? Okay, so there is one, one perspective of that, but we don't think of that as a regularization. Okay, interesting question. I hadn't thought of that. All right, anything else? Okay. All right. Uh, so anyway, we are now talking about uh, uh, about uh, gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent. I think. Let's see what else. We <coughs> so this talks about uh, quality of sampling based on estimates, and uh, and this talks about uh, the nature of the samples from the distribution and so on. Right. I guess this, this is there's a lot of nitty gritty. They're all interesting to look at. Sometimes I don't cover all of that in great detail, but if you want to look at it, you'll need to read all of this. Um, ah, this is talking about the sampling. Okay, this is uh, when you are computing the gradient, when you're saying there is an expectation, computing this expectation is very expensive. You're going over, require, require summation over every training sample. So instead of uh, going over every training sample, we randomly sample a small small set. So this says uh, when you're computing the derivative, we don't necessarily use all the samples. And uh, quality of sampling uh, is uh, based on what? It's based on the estimate. Uh, uh, quality of sampling based sampling based. Okay, how good is the quality of sampling based est estimate? Standard error for mean from n samples is sigma over square root of n, where sigma is the standard deviation of the samples. Denominator shows that error decreases less than linearly with number of samples. So, hundred samples versus how many samples should you choose? In stochastic gradient descent. We say let's take some samples, and we compute this loss function not over the entire training set but some small number. Example, 100 samples versus 10,000 samples. Computation increases by a factor of 100. 100 times 100 is 10,000. But uh, error decreases by only a factor of 10. Right. So this is the standard error. So this is saying, if you're going to be using sampling, by saying, I'm going to get more and more and more samples, uh, you are not uh, you're doing that much better. Uh, it decreases only by a factor of 10, but the computation increases. So you have to do a lot, lot of more work to get uh, even a slight decrease. And this is sample size versus standard error. So the sample size uh, is uh, going down and, uh, and in the beginning it, it comes down dramatically and then it becomes very, very small afterwards, the changes. So optimization algorithms converge much, much faster if allowed to rapidly compute approximate estimates rather than slowly compute the exact gradient. Hmm. There is an interesting, uh, see the machine learning is full of some surprises here. This is saying um, you are better off by using a small uh, sample size, uh, which is the mini batch we're talking about and uh, rather than um, rather than work with the whole thing again and again. So it converges uh, much faster. So it, the, here is all the mathematical justification uh, to do that. A motivation for sampling is redundancy. So training set may be redundant. Worst case, all M examples are identical and sampling based estimate could use M times less computation. So this is saying that uh, you might have a training set, you've accumulated all this data, a lot of it is the same thing. Uh, if you're not gonna use all of it and you're sampling it, you're, you're being much smarter. 
in practice unlikely to find worst case situation but likely to find large number of examples that will uh, make similar contribution to gradient anyway so these are all some interesting observations about why stochastic gradient descent comes into play batch gradient methods batch or deterministic gradient methods the optimization methods uh, use all training samples in a large batch and uh, batch is also used to describe mini batch used by mini batch stochastic gradient descent batch gra gradient uh, descent implies use a full training set and batch size refers to size of a mini batch anyway so there is some confusing terminology on batch versus mini batch as long as we know what we're doing we're saying take a small number rather than the entire data set stochastic or online methods uh, those using a single sample are called stochastic or online okay so you could also try one sample at a time online typically means continually created samples rather than multiple passes over a fixed training set so there is a useful terminology to remember uh, you know when we purchase some new device uh, for example uh, with a fingerprint uh, biometric control uh, it uh, learns from you know few examples right so maybe even one example and uh, we call that as an online where it is saying uh, it is uh, just using uh using uh, you know one sample or a small number of samples um and uh, uh so so those are online methods as opposed to stochastic methods where we use mini batch or um, or mini batch stochastic or simply stochastic so there is a difference between a single sample which is online or a small sample like that where basically you are you are adapting to the system So what are what about mini batch size? They are driven by the following factors. Larger batches means more accurate gradient, but less than uh, linear returns, right? So you might you get a better uh, gradient, but uh, uh, but uh, with uh, less than linear returns. Okay, all right. Uh, Multi-core architectures are underutilized by extremely small batches. all right so um, um so there are some uh, issues in terms of utilization of the data okay and if all examples are processed in parallel amount of memory scales with batch size all right so these are all factors and uh, uh we have uh, gpu architectures more efficient with with power of 2 range from 32 to 256 but sometimes 16 for large uh, large models okay so so the, okay what is the take away from this slide is that uh, mini batch of 32 uh, or even 16 is is probably what is recommended okay maybe you know that already distributed synchronous sgd you may want to took it took at this uh, look at this what happens when you have mini batch size increasing from 64 128 they're going on and on uh validation error goes up so it is kind of advantageous to use smaller batch sizes uh regularizing effect of small batches so this is another topic in regularization itself this is real regularization as opposed to uh as opposed to surrogate function uh here uh, small batches offer regularizing effect due to noise added in the process and uh, generalization is best for uh, batch size of 1 uh small batch size requires small learning rates okay there is another thing to maintain stability uh, due to high variance of the estimate of the gradient so there is some trade off there also so use of mini batch information different algorithms use different information from the mini batch and algorithms using gradient g are robust and can handle smaller batch sizes like 100 all right and uh, second order methods using hessian compute updates such as h inverse g so you would have to you in a normal gradient descent we just use g right so that is what uh, multiplies the uh, learning rate 
in if you're using second order methods you use you have to compute the hessian invert the hessian matrix and uh, if you're using a second order method require much larger batch size like 10000 that's interesting so a second order method would require uh, higher batch sizes and uh, crucial to select many batches randomly all right that's another uh, thing to know and uh, uh computing expected gradient from a set of samples requires that sample independence right? so randomness is important and uh, many data sets are arranged with successive samples highly correlated so that's something to watch out for is that uh, blood sample data set has five samples for each patient if you're using blood samples uh there might be five together will uh, for the same patient and so it's necessary to shuffle the samples for a data set with billions of samples shuffle once and store it in shuffled fashion so random selection of the data set is important that's another interesting takeaway of how optimization is done i guess this is useful you see by knowing about the algorithm you are learning something practical which is uh, how should your data set be arranged should it all be in the original form or should you shuffle it all right so simple random sampling define the population say training set as 10000 examples choose your batch size say 100 that sounds like a very large number list the population and assign numbers to them and use a random number generator between 1 to 1000 and select your sample this is telling you how you could uh, uh, choose samples uh, randomly simple random sampling all right so you want to choose 100 from 10000 and uh, and it is saying uh, use a random number generator to get a number between 1 to 1000 and uh, select your sample uh, by properly assigning numbers to them okay so so it seems like an obvious thing parallelization of mini batches okay that's another issue and uh, sgd and generalization error so so there are there is a whole uh, theory here that shows uh, how sgd minimizes generalization error so and uh, see easiest to easiest to see equivalence in online learning and uh, this uh, arguments here that show that uh, uh, the generalization error uh, is being minimized here by using um, this stochastic gradient descent where we are using many batches and also a relationship to epochs right multiple epochs and let's see let's see what this is there are so many little uh, little pieces of advice that's being conveyed here impact of growing data sets data sets are growing more rapidly than computing power that's for sure right <laughs> we create so much data uh more common to use each training sample only once or even make an incomplete pass through the data set with a large training set overfit is uh, not an issue underfitting and uh, computational efficiency become in predominant concerns oh okay All right so uh, this is uh, showing us a whole range of things All right so um let's see where we'll go from here so that last set of slides had some interesting advice about optimization many batches size of many batches random sampling that kind of thing which is very practical and useful stuff this next one is about challenges in uh, neural network optimization and all right challenges in neural network optimization 
All right. So this is uh, again uh, optimization, uh, and and it talks about gradient descent. We have seen this before, but let me repeat. This dotted line is uh, one half of x squared, and uh, uh, and we have uh, this is f f of x, right? This, this function is f of x. We are trying to find uh, the minimum of this. This is a convex optimization problem. For what value of x is this f of x minimized, which is here? Where that is at x equal to zero is, is the minimum here. Let's say we started out at this point over here, then we take the derivative of uh, f there, and the derivative of uh, this particular function is, uh, is x squared and uh, f of x equal to one half x squared. So the derivative f prime of x is equal to x. So at this point, uh, you know, we have this choice. And so we need to uh, reduce the value that we have for uh, uh, the value of x there to head towards zero. So we take the negative of the derivative, right? Negative. So global minimum x equal to zero, since f prime of x equal to zero, the gradient descent gets to this point. So we compute the, uh, the, the derivative and uh, we use that the negative of the derivative, which will change the current value to a lower value, lower value, lower value like that. On the other hand, if, if we had been on this side, we need to increase the value of x. So we take the derivative again, the, we have the derivative f prime of x is less than zero is negative. So we take the negative of that quantity, which becomes positive, which means x is increased, increased, increased. So this kind of explains uh, the, negative of the gradient. Why do we use the negative of the gradient is explained. We need to go hey, this way if you're on this side or if you're gonna here, proceed this way, right? So, so that is the motivation for the negative of the gradient in optimization. And this is of course convex optimization where we keep on uh, computing the derivatives which corresponds to tangents. And uh, when uh, training neural networks, we must conf confront non-convex cases. So we have so many so many uh, valleys and so on. So there is a whole range of challenges in finding this minimum and uh, ill conditioning, it's a matrix issue, local minima, plateau, saddle points and flat regions, cliffs and exploding gradients, long-term dependencies, uh, poor correspondence between local and global structure, theoretical limits of optimization. So this is a whole area of uh, mathematically related topics. And this talks about ill conditioning of the Hessian. It sounds like a very technical topic. Hessian is nothing but the second derivative of the function, loss function, that's what it is. And uh, when uh, even when optimizing convex functions, one problem is a ill-conditioned Hessian. Okay, this is a convex function with a minimum at the center here. And uh, what is uh, the conditioning of the matrix? If we have a Hessian matrix, which is the matrix of all the derivatives, uh, second derivatives, uh, the, uh, and we compute the eigenvalues of this Hessian matrix. And uh, this is the what is called as the uh, conditioning number, condition number is the highest eigenvalue divided by lowest eigenvalue. That's the conditioning. Problem uh, with the large condition number, with large condition is called ill condition. If this condition number, num conditioning is very large, steepest descent uh, uh, converge uh, convergence rate is slow for ill condition problems. Oh, wow. So this says uh, if the loss function is of this form, so it can take a large number of steps and, uh, uh, and it is showing one of these, maybe this one is ill-conditioned. I don't know, it's not very clear from these pictures of these functions here. And maybe it's taking much larger number of steps as opposed to a fewer number of steps here. Anyways, you may want to take a look at it online to see what people are saying about ill-conditioned Hessian. So why would we want to look at the Hessian is it's, it, it's going to tell you something about uh, the rate at which it's going to converge. Okay, that sounds like a useful thing, right? If you're, if you're spending a lot of time figuring out how to optimize uh, your neural network, this is saying the Hessian may give you some interesting information. If it is ill-conditioned, then it's going to take a long time. 
result of ill conditioning is what's being talked about. Uh, it, it, in order to see all of this, you have to apply a Taylor series here, where we have an example, f of x is written as f of x naught, x minus x naught, this is the gradient g, x minus x naught uh, transpose, uh, and this is uh, uh, hx, second derivative here, right? And uh, I think this should have been x minus x naught squared, probably. Mm. Okay. And, uh, and then we have substituting x equal to x naught minus epsilon g, that is the gradient descent. So this is giving this expression. Uh, it says um, we have to add to the loss function, the epsilon, the derivative times derivative, and it involves the Hessian and the derivative, all right? So uh, the stochastic gradient descent, when you expand it to the second term here, uh, gradient descent step normally is minus epsilon g. Uh, and we'll add to the cost uh, minus epsilon g transpose g when you use the second derivative. To ill conditioning becomes a problem when uh, this inequality is satisfied. Uh, to determine whether ill conditioning uh, is detrimental, monitor g transpose g and g transpose h g terms, right? So learning becomes very slow despite a strong gradient. So there is a lot to be learned by looking at the loss function and its first derivative and its second derivative to tell you um, the rate of convergence. So that's about ill-conditioned uh, Hessian. Now we're talking about a local minimum. So in convex optimization, problem is one of finding a local minimum and uh, some convex functions are flat region rather than a global minimum. And uh, any point within flat region is acceptable. All right. So uh, many deep models are guaranteed to have an extremely large number of log minima. So you're gonna have an extremely large number and this is not necessarily a major problem. Okay. So model identifiability. So there might be like more than one uh, setting that could uh, lead to the same answer. That's called the identifiability problem. We'll just, uh, you know, that, that seems like a common problem, particularly with large number of parameters. You know, setting one set of parameters here, resulting results in um, some performance. And on the other side, there is some kind of symmetry going on. It'll give you the same results. So ill conditioning. Uh, so every time you're running an experiment, you're getting another set of values and performing the same. Uh, plateaus and saddle points and uh, more common than local minima maxima are another kind of zero gradient point, uh, a saddle. Okay, here is an example of a saddle. For Newton's uh, second order method, saddle points pose a problem. Explains why second order methods have not replaced gradient descent. So second order methods have not replaced simple stochastic gradient. SGD is the first order method, but then why do we need Hessian? Is uh, Hessian can be useful to figure out what's happening with these surfaces. Look at all these interesting things. Plateau, these are, this is a plateau and it's got two minima here. And then this one is a ravine. This is all in weight space, the weight space and this is the log uh, likelihood, all right? So that's being plotted over here. Um, so anyway, it's all about the surfaces and things, cliffs and exploding gradients. Neural networks with many layers have steep regions resembling cliffs. Hmm, loss function has these things. Uh, the result from multiplying several large weights, example, RNNs with many factors at each time step. Uh, gradient update step can move parameters extremely far, jumping off cliff altogether. And cliffs are dangerous from either direction. So gradient clipping heuristics can be used. Hmm. Uh, there is something called uh, long-term dependencies. Uh, when you have a computationally, uh, computational graphs are extremely deep. You can have, uh, uh, I think some of these are taken care of by things like, you know, ResNet and so on. You know, I'm not sure about that. Um, inexact gradients. 
So optimization algorithms assume we have access to the exact gradient or a Hessian matrix. In practice, we have a noisier biased estimate. So every deep learning algorithm relies on sampling based estimates using mini batch. So keep in mind uh, when you are using stochastic gradient descent using mini batch, you are using a sampling based method to uh, optimize your uh, algorithm, all right? Um, So in other, in other cases, objective function is intractable, in which case gradient is intractable as well. Con so gradient can be intractable. So contrastive divergence gives a technique for approximating the gradient of the intractable log likelihood of a Boltzmann machine. All right, so Boltzmann machine, we haven't seen it yet. It uh, uh, comes in when we, when we look at uh, generative models. So poor correspondence between local and global structure. Uh, need for good initial points. Optimization based on local downhill moves can fail if local surface does not point towards the global solution. And the research directions are aimed at finding good initial points uh, for problems with a difficult global structure. All right, so this is saying that there is also issues of uh, you know, starting point, you know, can, can, how can we make that good? And then there are some theoretical limits of optimization. Um, you know, these theoretical limits have no, no practical bearing and some apply only to network that output discrete values. And some show that there exist problem classes that are intractable, but difficult to tell whether problem falls in that class. So there is no dearth of difficult problems here. And I've just given you a, 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 you know, a bird's eye view of some of these topics, but it's interesting to know that these things exist. Right. So let's take up one more set of slides maybe and uh, call it quits after that. So let's, uh, um, Okay, now we get into basic optimization algorithms. So what do we learn here? Uh, this is uh, stochastic gradient descent, momentum, Nesterov momentum. So we just saw this diagram, stochastic gradient descent. So in gradient descent, we, we take the negative of the gradient value and uh, we change the previous setting. This of course is the f of x squared. The x in this case is the weights, right? Rather than the inputs, this is x, this is the weight. Cretian function is minimized by moving from current solution in direction of negative of gradient. Stochastic gradient descent is accelerated by mini batches downhill. Wide use for machine learning in general and for deep learning in particular. And uh, average gradient on a mini batch is an estimate of the gradient. So stochastic gradient descent follows gradient estimate uh, downhill. All right, this shows the algorithm here, learning rate epsilon k. Oh, okay, it's being specialized to the kth step. Initial parameter theta, while stopping criterion not met do and sample a mini batch of m examples from the training set. So you're gonna sample here, m examples with corresponding targets y and compute the gradient estimate, the gradient g hat one over m derivative loss function, the loss of f and y. So this is the difference between the, between what the model is computing and what it should have output. And uh, this summation is over the, all the samples here, right? The samples here. And apply, apply the update, theta gets theta minus epsilon g hat. So this is the basic stochastic gradient uh, update at training iteration k. A crucial parameter is the learning rate epsilon that's going here. At iteration k, it is epsilon sub k, we can say, right? But if we are always using the same thing, it's just epsilon, but uh, we are allowing 
that to change. So the choice of the learning rate. Here is the starting point. Small learning rate takes forever to go to the bottom. And uh, if you choose it too large, it, it keeps jumping from here to here to here, and it jumps over the minimum and ends up over here, overshoots the minimum. So it can keep on overshooting if you choose a large learning rate. So the small learning rate is taking a long time. If gradient is small, then you can safely try a larger, this is saying try a larger uh, learning rate if the gradient is small and uh, which compensates a small gradient is the larger step. So this is uh, changing the, uh, uh, the, learning, uh, the uh, learning rate here by taking larger steps here and it's taking smaller steps here. And uh, and so so these are the epsilon caves are are changing here. Choice of learning rate. So learning rate in Keras. Keras provides SGD class to implement SGD optimizer with learning rate and momentum. The default learning rate is 0 0.01, and no momentum is used. So this example is uh, Keras optimizer import SGD, and uh, so this is. Uh, the, uh, the uh, um, default is 0 0.01. I guess this is the setting the default here. Need for decreasing the learning rate. Try a uh, true gradient of a cost function becomes small and then zero. We can use a fixed learning rate. Uh, but SGD has a source of noise and random sampling of M training samples. Gradient does not vanish even when we arrive at the minimum. Sufficient condition for SGD convergence is uh, what's given here in these equations, inequality here. Common to decay learning rate linearly until it, at iteration tau epsilon k is equal to one minus alpha epsilon plus alpha epsilon tau with alpha equal to k over t, right? So, so after iteration tau, it is common to leave epsilon constant. So it's a way of update. Take the previous uh, version. I, th I think this should have been epsilon zero here. Epsilon zero. You may want to check out the deep learning book to see the exact equation. Um, okay, no, it continues with epsilon t again. Okay, learning rate decay. So decay learning rate. So learning rate is calculated at each step. So this is what learning rate is being calculated. It's getting smaller and smaller. So that's uh, the adaptive nature of things. And this is the momentum method. SGD is a popular optimization strategy, but it can be slow. Momentum method accelerates learning while facing high curvature, small but consistent gradients, noisy gradients. And the algorithm accumulates moving averages of gradients and move in that direction while exponentially decaying. Right. So it is saying it's an average uh, of past gradient. It keeps track of the past gradient and keeps moving in that direction. So it's not jumping all over, it's going down a surface. And uh, it is saying, don't keep making sideways moves. Keep track of the fact that you're going down, going down, going down, you know. So momentum says, keep going in some direction by keeping track, because we are not talking about vectors here. There's not a single value. So that gives you the direction. So gradient descent uh, with momentum converges faster than standard gradient descent. This is a two dimensional case, W1, W2. And this is the uh, contours of constant density in this two dimensional space, which means there's a bowl sitting on this two dimensional plane. And uh, we, what this uh, means is we are sitting on, on, not right here on the two dimensional plane, we are sitting on, on top, that's just the projection here. And uh, we are trying to get to this minimum on this bowl. And instead of going directly, it is making all these side trips like that. 
So momentum reduces oscillation in W2 direction and uh, and uh, you know tries to go towards towards it directly all right so this is minimum this is gradient descent maybe going like that momentum method i suppose it's starting at a different point here rather than this point they didn't want to superimpose the, the pictures so it's kind of going more or less smoothly oh that sounds pretty clever so introduce variable v or velocity it's the direction and speed at which parameters move through parameter space Momentum in physics is mass times velocity. The momentum algorithm assumes unit mass. A hyperparameter alpha determines exponential decay. So there is a momentum update rule. So there is a, uh, the update rule is given by V gets alpha V minus, uh, this is the usual derivative we, we deal with. And so instead of updating the parameter from Directly like this, uh, we, we bring in this velocity to play a role. The velocity uh, V accumulates the gradient element. So the directionality and all is somehow uh, included here. And uh, there is alpha V, the previous, pre so the previous direction is what was it before? And alpha times V, that's a vector we're dealing with here and take the into account. And so the summation is being used. So the larger alpha is relative to epsilon, the more previous gradient effects um, the current direction. And the SGD algorithm with momentum is next. So this is SGD with momentum, which looks exactly like SGD, but it's got a slight variant here. V gets compute velocity update. And that velocity update is what is used to update the parameters. So previously we used to just directly update the parameters with this quantity, this is saying use. So this is a very minor change, it looks like. So in Keras, the learning rate can be specified via the LR argument and the momentum can be specified via the momentum argument. So it says use SGD learning rate 0 0.01, momentum equal to 0.9. Ah, there is the explanation. So you might have done it already, uh, but if you haven't, uh, there is a there is an option you have to specify momentum, SGD with uh, uh, momentum. Comparison SGD without momentum, which, which without momentum is going, so they actually are showing in this plot something about uh, how it's taking fewer steps here as opposed to with, without momentum, speeds it up. Nestor of momentum is uh, a variant to accelerate the uh, gradient with update. So it looks like there is something here, the loss function alpha V is coming into play. Uh, parameters alpha and uh, uh, epsilon play a similar role as standard momentum method. Uh, difference between nestor of and standard momentum is where, uh, where gradient is evaluated. So there's only one step here in the V step. And uh, nestor of gradient is evaluated after the current velocity is applied, thus can Interpret Nesterov as attempting to add a correction factor to the standard method of momentum. So SGD uh, from with Nesterov momentum uh, shows the difference here. This line is added from plane momentum. So, so momentum method was these three lines here. There's one more, one more line being added here to put some Nesterov correction. Keras SGD with Nesterov momentum is SGD uh, LR DK momentum nestor of equal to true. Do you want the nestor of version of it? Okay, all right. So there is a lot of options here. Okay, all right. Uh, given the election and all is going to go on, I think we will we will quit a little bit early today. Um, Mohammed, are you ready to take over and do a small breakout on on these topics? So, uh, Professor, it's uh, it's still going to take like around ten minutes. Um, there is some code which is you know uh, in progress. So, all right, you uh, want me to do one more? Okay. Yeah, this one. All more. right, so I'll cover uh, one more topic then. There's so much of it, and there is a, a challenge to see every you know what all do we want to learn? Right? There's so much to it. And 
So we did a basic optimization. Let's see what else comes up afterwards. Uh, parameter, in, that sounds like a good topic. Parameter initialization, let's do that one. Parameter initialization strategies. Okay, so we are into the fifth topic in optimization already. So the role of initialization. So non-iterative uh, optimization requires no initialization. We know that if you have a closed form solution to the uh, parameters, then uh, simply solve for the solution point, right? We, we know that we can do that in simple regression and so on. Uh, but an iterative method, uh, uh, if it is iterative, but converge regardless of initialization. So if you, irrespective, if you are able to uh, converge, uh, then acceptable solutions in acceptable time. But only uh, iterative, but affected by choice of initialization. So, or uh, deep learning uh, training algorithms are iterative. Initialization determines whether it converges at all and can determine how quickly learning converges. So this deep learning is largely in the third category. Uh, it is not a simple uh, uh, convex minimization that is what would be into the second uh, area. This is the third area to affect by the choice of initialization. Keras initialization. So initializations define the, define the way the, to set the initial random weights of Keras layers. The keyword arguments used for passing initializers to layers will depend on the layer. Usually it's simply kernel initializer and bias initializer. Look at this in Keras, you say kernel initializer is equal to random uniform and bias initializer zeros. Available initializers in Keras, so you can use zeros once constant, random normal, random uniform, truncated normal, variance scaling, orthogonal identity, lacoon uniform, right? So there are so many initializers. Modern initialization strategies are simple and heuristic based on achieving nice properties, but problem is a difficult one, all right? Some initial points are beneficial for optimization, but detrimental to generalization. That's interesting that uh, initialization can affect the generalization. A known property is a break symmetry. Only property known with certainty is initial parameters must be chosen to break symmetry. What do you mean by symmetry? If two hidden units have the same inputs and same activation function, then they must have different initial parameters. So uh, if, let's say we have uh, both of them are using uh, sigmoid or relu and, but they have the same inputs, uh, then they must have different initial parameters. Usually best to initialize each uh, unit to compute a different function, All right? This uh, motivates a use of, uh, use random initialization of the parameters. Something about choice of biases also. Weights drawn from a Gaussian. Weights are almost always drawn from a Gaussian or uniform distribution. Yeah, that's why we saw something called Lekun uniform or it could be Gaussian. So choice of Gaussian or uniform does not seem to matter much but not studied exhaustively. Scale of the initial distribution does not have an effect on the outcome of optimization. Larger initial weights will yield a stronger symmetry breaking effect, uh, helping avoid redundant units. Too large may result in exploding value. So there is some optimal here also. Heuristics for initial uh, scale of weights. So one heuristic is to initialize the weights of a function connected layer with n inputs and n out outputs by sampling each weight from uniform. So this is a uh, heuristics for initial scale of the weights. 
initialization for the biases. Okay. Anyway, that is uh, something to look at. Uh, the main uh, takeaway there is that uh, they are coming from some Gaussian and those uh, library functions, that's what they do for you. Uh, professor, uh, how yeah. would we uh, find out the best initializer for a particular problem? Yeah. Available initializers in Keras, right? Zeros, ones, constant, random. You got, can you see, still, can you still see it? My slide? Yes, Professor. Okay. Uh, Very good question. Let's, let's see if we can try and answer that. So we have all these methods for initialization. So your question is, uh, should I use uh, zeros, ones, or constant, or random number, or Lacoon uniform? They got all of these things here. Um, some initial points are beneficial for optimization, but detrimental to generalization. Sounds like this is all, uh, this is all trial and error. One property known with certainty, initial parameters might be chosen to break. That one we saw already. And uh, weights are almost drawn from a Gaussian or a uniform. It seems that that's the popular approach. And let's see among these methods. Uh, yeah, there it is, random normal and then random uniform or Lacoon uniform. There's some difference between random uniform and Lacoon uniform. It looks like these are the popular ones. Random normal or random uniform. And uh, I mean, I'm just going by some kind of popularity measure here, which is not a very scientific way of saying it, but uh, it looks like a lot of people have experimented with it. Hmm. All right. So, yeah, not a not a very clear clear cut answer, and um, uh, the, you know those uh, those libraries seem to be making all of these uh, available. And the answer in in these you see we're dealing with all of these very very complicated functions which we're trying to uh, optimize, find the minimum, and so on. That's why when we I doubt said it itself, we said this is a difficult problem, and we are trying our best to run through all of this and figure out what is the best way to do it. And uh, so this even starts about what is a good initialization point. So, so sometimes you see people arguing doesn't matter and the, so many, the surface is so complicated that uh, it doesn't matter where you start and where you end up with. But if we wanted to uh, choose a good one, some of these might be, might be the way, ways of doing it, okay? All right, so not a very satisfactory answer, but there is something, okay. All right, any other question? All right, Mohammed, how are you doing? Yeah, yes, Professor. I think I'm good. You're so ready? there is one question from the student. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. No, no this is not regarding the lecture. That's okay. regarding the project to Zoom okay. meeting. Let me uh, stop the recording and we'll we'll take that up. Um, okay.